Hiya, hiya. Well, here we are. That's, as, as soon as it's uh, quiet on the set, Jay starts talking. You got like a, you have a CBS. Uh, I, you never got it out of your system, did you? Being a jock. I never will. You know, I you know. know. And, and you, you, the light goes on and you do 10 minutes. You probably do that in front of the refrigerator. No, I'm only allowed seven seconds over the intro. That's, a, yeah, that's all Yeah, well, you should right. have been allowed seven seconds in front of the refrigerator looking at you. But I don't want to start on that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you already did. I know. So you, do you notice something different about me? Um, you're not as dark as you were yesterday. I don't know where you're lighter than you were yesterday. No, come wow. on. Oh, you got new headphones. We're, no, we're on phase two in Florida, so oh. I actually uh, got a haircut. That's, That's right. right. Look at you. Yeah, I was able to get close to somebody with scissors, and uh, and the guy has uh, done a good job, didn't he? I mean, look at oh, all of a sudden. You're very, I don't, you're very Hollywood. You're very yeah, Hollywood. I don't look like Ryan Seacrest anymore. No. Wait a minute. <laughs> so the, the thing is that, that we have Eddie Brill here, and Eddie, Eddie has been, we've been wanting to talk to him for, uh, since we had the show on ABC. It's yeah. uh, been a long time. We had him there, and then, you know, he, he, he only gives you a little bit of time, though, because he's used to sets. Oh, he's big. All right. <laughs> but now, living. you know, we're doing these, you know, I have a, three different podcasts that I'm in charge of, and most of them are 40 minutes to an hour, a lot of the interviews that we've been doing. Oh, so what have you been doing? Tell me, tell me where they are. We'll get that. The main one is called uh, OG for the Organic Grill, OG Talk. And it's a great restaurant in the East Village. And we did like 25 of them from the restaurant. And I used, you know, uh, you know, Colin Quinn and Artie Lang and Judy Gold and on and on and on. Roy Wood Jr. And, and also, but it's just a really fun, great show. And it's, uh, we've been doing, it's on YouTube, so you could see it. And, uh, but now we're starting to film a bunch of them like this, a bunch of YouTube. I just did a bunch of rock and rollers uh, guys, John Joseph of uh, the Chrome Mags, and uh, it, it's it's a pretty good show, and it's it's really good. Also, uh, two other ones I've done, but they're all audio. Uh, one is uh, oh, that's a podcast. Yeah, a podcast. But yeah, so see, this is a triple cast. This here, so you know, this is what I've been wanting to do for about five years, but we weren't able to do it. At NBC in the Times Square, when I was in the window there at NASDAQ, we started this, and uh, nobody supported it because we were on a digital channel, you know, NBC's digital channel. Four nobody knew what two. that was. Yeah. And so uh, when we were doing that, it was uh, it was rather tough to get people to to know who we were and where we are and you know all that business. But right. you know, uh, the uh, the the world now has become what we call uh, shop talk by regular people. They're all, they, they now use the word uh, brand. You know, everybody has a brand. Right. This is kids walking around the house now. You know, what's your brand? Yeah. <laughs> and and, they, and they, all, they, they also have all the, they have the language. When I was a kid, we, in, we wanted to get into radio, first of all, and television. Right, of and nobody ever really used that language. We didn't know what Segway was. I mean, that was a big word for me to learn. And, uh, and I was on a foreign language station. A guy had an album, and he wanted me to segue from one cut to the other. I said, that's not how it works. you got to have two, two different things. <laughs> but, you know, we, we were learning a language then, and, and it, there was a language in the industry. And in television, of course, you know, with all the years you spent, and in the clubs. You know, a set. What's a set? Yeah. Uh, now people use this language like they're, like they're all Andy Warhol. 15 minutes, you know, remember? 15 minutes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I said, I, I think Andy said, uh, soon will be the time when everybody's famous for 15 minutes. Yeah. I think now it's down to about one. Yeah, I you think, know. yeah, I think it's a, a shorter span. But people don't have the attention span to go 15 minutes in a lot of cases. I don't agree with that. I think people will stay with you when they're interested. I know people who, you know, they watch the episodes of OG Talk and they're 40 minutes, 55 minutes. It's just someone, if they don't dig you in the first minute or three, they're moving on. And that's what the... Yeah. the well, doing. that's true. you got to grab them at first. Yeah. But you know how to do that. You've been doing that all your life. Yeah, you do that. The first joke, you got to get a laugh in the first 10 to 20 seconds. Uh, Les, Paul, Les Paul, when I was doing some stand-up with him... Uh, oh, stand-up. See, there's another word yeah, for there it. You there. <laughs> you the bass, the stand-up bass. It was funny. He was sitting down. So. Right. <laughs> but Les, Les said to me... Uh, you got three shots. She said, the first one you throw out, and you got to feel what the audience is all about. If you don't get the laugh, then you got the second one, 
then you have to go into something that you think might work. And if that doesn't work, you better go into what already is proven. And if that don't work, there's a phone call for you. Get off. <laughs> and you know, I met you at Caroline's. I'm going to go into yeah. your stuff now. Yeah, with Schimmel. Yes. Schimmel working you, together. You, you were also a big fan of and a champion of helping other comics. Yeah. And every, I think it was every Friday, wasn't it, when you did every that? Every Monday. For 14 Monday? years, I hosted this, uh, you know, and I try to help comics. So, you know, but I would, because I got the help, you know, uh, we, we look out for each other. It's, you know, it's been like that forever and ever. You know, you influenced by others. You know, when I was a young comic, these, a lot of great comics had come up and it helped me. I mean, even my first Letterman set, David Brenner and Joan Rivers, they both helped me with my set. You know, they, comedians, doesn't matter how old you get or how long you've been doing it, you care for the other people in the industry. I and mean, the people say, oh, everyone's a jerk and it's, it's all, all about themselves. It's like that, but it's not like that. Most of it is about helping other people. Yeah. Yeah, and you no, know, can, you can you help Jay at all? Because you know he's got—he uh, seems to be a, a prop comic. Okay, well I he can. Dropped, he dropped the phone twice in yeah, the first right. ten minutes of the show here. A drop prop. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be Gallagher when I grow up. Yeah, I don't want to grow up. That's. The <laughs> <laughs> so Jay, you've been dying to have Eddie Eddie join us since we. Uh, we, we only had that little well, time. I had some other time with him, so I, I'll surrender some well, space. Yeah. Well, here's why. I, I not only love his comedy, I love his writings. He, he, I read his stuff on Facebook. And Eddie, you write very intricate, fairly long, no offense, but you know, it, no it's, offense, to me it's not too long. Hmm. See, that's that attention span again. Yeah, I can, we can't hear you, Jay. There's no We sound. lost you now. Of course, there was a picture that's now. He's complimenting me, and uh, <laughs> I'm just like, that's enough. We can't There's a blackout on, sh on yeah. schmooze. <laughs> yeah. so can you hear us? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, now I can hear you. Now you're back. Okay, so you're continuing on. You were, you were saying just starting right too long, and then you throw it away. I know. Well, I think what happened. <laughs> went away again. <laughs> Well, well you know, not, this is sort of like a comedy show in a sense. Oh, definitely. You're not supposed to get stroked. Can't hear this you. Is it. <laughs> <laughs> so now, look at his mouth. It's I can going. read his so I'm having a problem. <laughs> Which is a bad radio guy. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm there back. You. There he is. What are you doing with your sound? What's going on? I, my son called. I hit that off and everything went haywire. I don't know. That's okay. Your son is a disc jockey, right? Yeah. So anyway, so I, I love, love his DJ Facebook. I love his fa Facebook stories. So Eddie, keep it up. Thank they're you. funny. They're 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 very um, wonderfully written. And on top of that, I learned something about the comedy business, which is tremendous. It's it's not. Yeah, easy. you know, it's been really fun for me. I I write every day. You know, and when I was at Letterman, I was helping comics and booking comics, and I was focusing on other people's careers more than my own. And then, um, but since that's all in the past, the last five years, I've been doing a lot of my own writing. And then, you know, you, it's like anything, it's a muscle and you, I write every day and I, uh, and I improve on the stories and I, I've gotten this sort of style down and I, and I don't mind being vulnerable and share, you know, and I never try to hurt anyone. Even if I have a story about something that went awry, I won't mention the person's name or just so that people get a lesson from it or not a lesson, but just get a, a a view into what happens. Well, you've you've worked with so many unbelievable comics over the years and held some incredible gigs as well. So you have a plethora of of stories, I would assume. You well, you know what's funny? You said plethora. When it, when I was in high school, there was a kid named Ken, and Ken was a great guy, but he was a little bit kissy kiss ass with all of the, with, especially in English class. And he would sit in the front, and he always wanted to. Who wants to read today? Ken would be like, oh, I want to read, I want to read. And we all, we kind of, and he was handsome and all the girls loved him. So we were kind of a little jealous of him. We didn't hate him. We were just jealous. So um, he would always read and be like, hello. And he'd read like with a fake accent and it was just horrible. And, you know, the, we're sitting in the back going, that damn Ken, he's too perfect. And the teacher was like fawning over him and loving him. And then he was reading something and he said, and the word plethora came up and he said plethora. 
And we <laughs> celebrated like we won the Super Bowl. We were so excited that Mr. Perfect Ken got that word wrong. And wow. Plethora, and he never lived it down for the rest of his life. Plethora. No, I have, I, so whenever there, I hear the plethora, I think of Perfect Ken and how us little jealous boys were, uh, we won that day. You know, do you know that uh, when we had the show on NBC radio in the afternoon, uh, I hired a couple of people, you know. One of them was uh, Grace Under Fire, was, yeah, right. and Brett Butler. Brett and, Butler and, then, yeah. and then the other was uh, Bill Sheff. Yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill got his working card, his uh, union card from, Very nice. from my show. And then he went out, he was a sports guy, essentially. Yeah. And I guess, you, you know, they, all these people wind up uh, in quality positions and they got to be big stars on television. And then I, w I was fired. It's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. That, ha that sometimes happens, you know, where you give everyone a break and then it's the, the break doesn't go your way. Yeah, I heard the that. The weird part about that is, is that, you know, you when you influence other people, as you have done throughout life, it, there has to be a kind of a glory, a kind of satisfying feeling that people have gone on to do well. Well, I do. I, I feel like that teacher who, who heard plethora. Uh, uh, yeah, plethora. Plethora, or whatever it was. <laughs> Diphtheria. <laughs> now, Eddie, is there, is there life uh, after, after Letterman for you, oh, yeah. honestly? Yeah. It's what is incredible. it? What is it? I mean, Letterman was amazing. In that theater, on that stage, with that man, every day for 17 years was dream come true. You know, best at the Ed Sullivan Theater, you know, standing in the spot where Elvis Presley and the Supremes and Beatles and everything. And Letterman was such is one of the greatest broadcasters in the history of the world. I mean, just to be there and to be in that that group of working with people who are the best at what they do. The cameraman Dave Dorsett was Cronkite, Walter Cronkite's cameraman. I mean, the writers were from Hartford, Harvard. The you know, everyone was the best at what they did. So you had to bring your game up, and I love that. But also, I have a freedom now. That's it's a different time in my life. I have the freedom. I do a lot more stand up, and I, you know, I've always done stand up, but now I focus on my stuff. I do a lot more writing, um, music, all different kinds of things. I'm. It just doesn't stop for me. I'm. I'm a. I'm a workaholic. So I'm doing well, all right. I think you have the energy, and and when the energy stops, then you're retired. I'm. I'm the same way. I'm not gonna. Yeah. You know, when when I'm done with the energy, then I'm done. Well, but yeah, until you're not then, done. I, yeah, I, we're not, none of us are done, you know, and I, I do miss the stage right now. We've been, you know, March 12th, I think, or 13th was yeah. Saturday night, whatever that Saturday was, was the last night I did stand up wow. uh, at Dangerfields that night. And uh, I miss that so much. I mean, I had that for most of my life. Um, but I'm doing a lot of other things and having fun doing that. You, it's well, hard well, yeah. to stand up here on Zoom. It really is lousy to try to do stand up. But you could do storytelling and, and interviews like this. It's I Well, I had it. John Pizzi on yesterday or whenever you watch this thing. And he had that wall behind him, you know, and uh, the, the brick wall yeah. that, that, that was at Stand Up New York and also at uh, the club on 45th Street. What was that place called? Uh, Don Giovanni's, which was yeah. the... It was the improv, yeah. Yeah, the improv. So, uh, you know, when you get that, when you see that wall, that's the vote of confidence. Yeah. That, that, yeah you you, you, you got to get yourself one of those... Uh, those uh, fake bricks. Oh, yeah. Get a fake I wall. and a behind me over there. You'll be fine. <laughs> One of my problems is I always hit the brick wall. That's what ah, happens. Now, <laughs> that's where you have to turn around and go the other way. Right. Are you, are, you, are you in New York, in Manhattan? Yeah, I'm in the East Village. And I've been yeah. since college, I mean, 40 years now since I've, I've been in the East Village. Um, are they gonna, they're going to lower the... I'm New York, but I'm, after college in Boston at Emerson, I came back. And I've been in the East Village ever since. I didn't know you went to Emerson. You know, my friend left a grant. Uh, Tom Chauvin left money. Uh, when he passed away, he handled Rick Dees and Dr. Laura, and he left the money to Emerson. And my other friend, Howard Lapidus, did you ever hear yes. of him? I knew him very well. Well, Howard's a good friend from Buffalo, you know. Yes, and he I became know. A, he became a, a good manager. He passed yeah. away a couple of years ago. I know. And I, I, uh, you know, went to Emerson, and yeah. I hear from her all the time. I didn't know you. I didn't know you knew each other. I would have. Brought yeah, your name up to him. we all know each other. You know, at Emerson, we started the comedy department there. And, you know, I was in school with a bunch of people who became, I mean, before us, uh, John, Jay Leno went there, Henry Winkler, Norman Lear, a lot of, uh, uh, Andrea Martin of, of SCTV. A lot all, of those, all those failures. 
Yeah. <laughs> and then when we, I was there, Dennis Leary and Mario Cantone and Lauren Dombrowski and on and on, Stephen Wright. And then, and then toward the end, it was Anthony Clark and Bill Burr and David Cross and Laura Keitlinger, Jennifer Coolidge. I mean, it just keeps, get, you know, the Emerson comedy. And now you can graduate uh, with a comedy degree at Emerson. That's amazing. Well, something well, that's, a, that's a great that's a great place to learn broadcasting because broadcasting is communication. And you know, I was telling the guys a story about Harvey Lembeck, who used to teach uh, sitcom in L.A. And I went to class with him uh, with Chris Lemon, who's Jack's son. Yeah. And Jack, Jack, Chris never wanted to be his father, and he didn't didn't ever try. You know, and he didn't want to do. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things he didn't want to do. He didn't want to do the improv. We were doing improv. He didn't want to do stand up. He didn't want to do a sitcom. He wanted to write. So mm -hmm. he became a really good writer. And one time at Elaine's, years later, when I was in New York, uh, Neil Simon, at a, at, a, at a book signing for Chris, his, his dad had passed, uh, Chris sat and, and, and he was told by Neil Simon he was a great writer. That was his achievement, you know, when he sat there and heard that. That's all you and need. This is graduation. You know, I, and I didn't ever become any of those things either, you know. Uh, so it's not, it isn't so much that you go to something for a specific reason. Like Emerson is a broad scope. It's right. a, it's a platform using that word now. Uh, it's a place where everybody gets together and learns and, and picks up on whatever they, whatever is their, their focus. You know what they want to do. You, you, you start with freedom and you start with, uh, with when people beating you up it, too. Yeah. You so who was the guy that beat you up? Who beat you up into comedy? Who beat me up in the comedy? Yeah, who was it? There was there had to be someone that said that, that was aggravating you. Who aggravated you when you started? No, not when I started. No, I you know when I started, I was in such great company. You know Barry Crimmins. I don't know if you've ever met Barry. Yeah. He had this club in Boston called the Ding Ho in Cambridge, and he was so caring for the community. We were so blessed and. We had all these incredible comedians, Don Gavin and, you know, these older, Kenny Rogerson, one of the greatest comics ever. You know, we just, we, there was no beating up. There was just helping <laughs> each other. Lenny Clark was, had a TV show on Channel 5 in Boston. He'd bring us all on. Mark Parento had a radio show at BCN. He'd bring us all on. We were really, we were coddled. We weren't beat, you know. And it was a blessing. And then I quit comedy after college because I thought, you know, that was cool, but I need a job, it was in advertising. And then I got it, you know, then I started missing it. And, uh, and I had a chance to start a comedy club, and I did, in the village. Oh, and you I, did? What was it called? Well, the Paper Moon. I don't and that. it was down on West 3rd Street. Uh, and uh, it, I brought in all the greatest comics. It was just an easy thing to do. You don't have to be that smart to bring in the best comedians. And then also, I started finding comics through other comics or like Brett Butler and Susie Essman and we'd bring all these comics in and we started growing together and Colin Quinn and on and on and on. And then we'd bring in Dennis Miller and you know, it was a, it was a good time. So we're all looking out for each other all the way through. It just, it was just a little, you know, I started doing well for myself and I gave the club up and it turned into the Boston comedy club, which got, you know, I gave it to the Barry Katz who made it the Boston Comedy Club. So since 1984, that space had done comedy and done it well for a very long time. But I was working every weekend because I was, you know, hosting the shows. You never became a friar, though, huh? I was a friar at one time for a year. Yeah. For years and years and years. And what then happened, I, to, what happened to those guys? You didn't like um, borscht. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the belt, the borscht belt. No, they, I would work there a lot. And I still had, done, up until recently, I were doing shows. They did Eddie Brill and Friends. And, okay. you know, I had Kevin Meany and Judy Gold and, you know, uh, some great comics. So I still was involved with them. I'm downtown. I'm not up in the 50s. So I don't, I never really went there. Well, Caroline's, that was in Times Square. Yeah, you know, Letterman was three blocks away from Caroline's. Yeah. So. Every Monday night, I would leave Letterman taping and go walk over to Caroline's. And, and then when the Caroline show was over, we had poker at my house. We, oh, you know, and she, she used to, that place, she had a place downtown, too, as yeah, I recall, on Fulton Street. Street. Her I first think. location was on uh, 8th Avenue, like around 27th or so. Yeah. And then she moved to, the broad, uh, to uh, downtown at the seaport. Yeah. I know a lot of people were uh, were in those days of, of comedy and stand up. Everybody worked. What about now? 
What, what happened? Where, where is everybody? I think that people are working. I think there's so many comedians. It's, um, you know, that people are doing the internet more. A lot of people are using the internet and getting followers on Twitter. And, and that's kind of where it's at because people are, you know, there's a, there's a small group of people who love stand up. They want to be great stand ups. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who do stand up so they can do other things. And uh, I think you get, there's so many people doing that kind of stuff. And like you said at the beginning, there's people who, you know, just wake up and they said, yeah, I want to be on the internet. And they go on and some people get very popular from that. I have oh, a yeah. love for the, the art of stand up. I always have. My parents love stand up. We always had the albums. My parents would take me to comedy shows. And, you know, I, I'm, you know, we're, I come from a funny family. So, uh, I've always loved stand-up. So of all the jobs I do and I've done, I still love the most number one doing stand-up comedy. Well, that's, that's a good thing because my favorite comic was Robert Schimmel. And he yes. was one of your best friends. Yes. He, he took me in, literally, into his house to live. He took me on the road. He wrote in his contract. Anywhere I worked, Eddie Brill had to open for me. And uh, I, it was, a, you know... It was like sitting at the feet of the masters. I, you know, I worked with Letterman, got to sit at the feet of Letterman for 17 years. For many, many years, unfortunately, he passed. Robert was just such a brilliant man and a good heart. And he took me everywhere he went. That's how I met you, through, through Robert. He, yeah. he opened all the doors for me, and he was just selfless. And he helped a lot of comics. He, he helped a lot of comics. Yeah, your 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 writings showed that, and you you adored that man, obviously. I, yeah, and, uh, I miss him. I talk to his kids all the time, and yeah. his ex-wife, and you know, I I they're all my, they're my family. I mean, Schimmel's parents were my my parents. His brother was my next door neighbor, you know. So I'm I'm a I'm a Schimmel. Well, 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 I don't know if you remember this or not, but uh, I had him on the show, and he was doing a comedy he was there to, to tell jokes and be funny and i mean just be himself he's funny and and he's very dry and make and, and elegant elegant comic so as he was talking and you know we got into a discussion about driving with his son who told him that he was dying and the comedy I mean, there's no comedy there and and robert just went into this whole serious thing so he said to me i can never do your show again because i can't go into that thing you know it's just it's it's tragic yeah. And, and I, 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 you know, my heart went out to him because he was such a real person. And, and I would go to see him because he was a natural. There's a guy who walked out on stage and just said what he said. He'd go, he was quietly, you know, he would go back to the stool and have his water and then say, you know, like that, make an expression. That's a very interesting way. I don't think, I've never seen anybody else do that, really. I know. Maybe Mount, maybe Mount, Lawrence, Monsey Lawrence, is that his name? Mal, Mal Z. Lawrence. Yeah, One maybe along comics. those lines. Yeah, and Robert was. You know, there are a few comics. Yeah. Robert, um, Schimmel, uh, I would say, Rich Jenny, um, I would say, Kenny Rogerson. These are comics that are not household names. No. Per se. Although Robert and Jenny were more than Kenny. All three of them are three of the greatest comics that have ever lived. And sometimes, for some reasons, they're not the big stars. Um, well, that's, that's why I had you here. Because we want the quality of people who the spotlight is not necessarily on you all of the time. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, you, you are very well respected because you are you. And I said, I want to do a series of long-form people who are celebrated by the people who celebrate and are still working. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is not a retirement village. No. And, and we're not broadcasting. And I'm not trying to get a gig over there down in Miami, one of the uh, Rickle Worlds, you know. Yeah. I, was, I, I wanted to have you on the show because I think uh, uh, Jay, first of all, uh, adores you anyway. But that's beside, besides the point. I don't go by him. Uh, I, have, I have to go by my own taste. <laughs> and and I, I have uh, such a high regard for your, for your uh, genius. But you'll never call yourself that. So I don't know. I would never expect that from you. You, you probably think of yourself as just, I don't know. What you're when you said it, you know, I don't think like that. No. I just think that, you know, you, the key really has always been is to stay vulnerable because that's the strength of, of artists and comedians and, uh, you know, artists that comedians who are artists is to really get rid of all the bullshit that you've had throughout your whole yeah. life, you know, lies and, and, you know, rules and all this stuff. If you get rid of all that, I, there's a, 
famous thing where Michelangelo, they asked him about the statue of David and how did you get that statue? How did you get David out of that chunk of marble? He said, I just chipped away the pieces that weren't him. Ooh, it's, it's incredible. So I, I think about that. You get rid of all the stuff that's not you and just be the most you. And that's where you, that's how you take it. And that, you know, now that I've, you know, comedy is my comedy, in my opinion, for my, myself, I've never been better at it because the more you do it, the better off you are. And, you know, that's why people like Rickles and Phyllis Stiller and you know, George Burns, they did it until they passed away because you just keep getting better. You have more life experience. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm loving it. I learn more and more. And I, you know, when comedians come up to me, what, what do I do? What do I do? I say, you can't teach it. You just got to get on stage. Yeah. Stage time, stage time, stage time. Jay, tell them what happened when I took uh, one of Jay Leno's jokes. Remember that? I vaguely remember that. Sorry. I, uh, I, I, I told Jay when we had him on the show, I said, oh, I love that joke. I, I told it. I, I took it from you. And he says, you what? Oh, he was furious. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he didn't think that was very funny. <laughs> yeah, I know, because it's your baby. And, you know, yeah. it's, you know, I've had a lot of people take my jokes and do them on television. And wow. it's just it's depressing. Um, and some very famous people taken it and they just you know sometimes people it's in the back of their head because they've heard it and then they say it but yeah. sometimes people just take your material and you work for years crafting this material and then someone just snips it does it and now everyone thinks it's that person's joke well how about forwarding all of these things that we do now on the internet where we forward these little cute one-liners and and pandemic uh, comedy if there is any comedy in a virus but you know what? You know what's interesting that you say that because I've just had this discussion yesterday. When when a tragedy happens, people say, "Oh, you must have a lot of jokes." Well, you can never joke about the tragedy. You can only joke about the scenario around the tragedy. And right. I'll give you examples. If you saw Life of Brian, Monty Python's Life of Brian, they were accused when the movie came out of being sacrilegious. And in fact, they were not at all. There was a thing where Jesus is on the mount and he's speaking, and um, these relig religious people were saying, how can you have Jesus and make fun of him? They weren't. They let Jesus say what he said, word for word. But it was the people behind him that were like, blessed are the cheesemakers. You know, they couldn't really hear him. because he <laughs> And the big laughs come from the idiocy of the people around them. Yeah. So the same thing where 9-11 um, happened. Now, I'll tell you an interesting story about two comedians from on Letterman. Two weeks before 9-11, Al Lubell went on Letterman. And he did a joke where he said, you know, and I, this is paraphrasing because I don't know the exact lines, but it was to the effect of, I am very nervous flying. I'm worried that the pilot will have a heart attack. And I know they have a co-pilot. What if he has a heart attack? And he says, I want the plane with me and all pilots. So if that one pilot dies, put another pilot on after. I'll be so confident I start shooting pilots. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, and you're laughing at his version of it's much better than the one I gave. Well, he did it on Letterman, got a big laugh. Two weeks later, he would have never been able to do that joke again. Yeah. All right, September 11th passes. Colin Quinn is going to appear on Letterman. And he has a joke that says, look, if you were at 9-11 and you were, uh, that's your place, I feel for you. But if you weren't, I don't want to hear your story. And he said, like, some people are like, you know, well, uh, if I would have taken the two train, I would have been right in the middle of all that. That, And he goes, do you take the two train? No, no. But if I did, he said, that's <laughs> like saying I, I would have been a, uh, an investment banker if I wasn't working the rides at Rye Playland. You know? <laughs> so, again, I'm paraphrasing the joke. But so you don't make fun of 9-11. You don't make fun of Jesus on the Mount. You don't make fun of, um, you know, the pandemic. But you make jokes around it like for me i'm a, i live alone so i wrote a line i said you know i haven't pleasured myself in the last few days was it something i said <laughs> <laughs> and so the joke is here we're all by ourselves we can't have sex we're all having sex by ourselves and then i'm not having it you know so there's that's the theory of that joke so you make fun of around it but you never say you know i mean never is not a good word but it's better not to say to make fun of the actual disease or whatever. And, and why is everybody on late night television talk about Trump? Why is that the whole, why is that always the joke? 
Is there any, um, is there any yeah, other material? It's a, shame. it's a shame. Like Colbert, it's very funny, but it's only Trump jokes. And, you know, they're good writers and not, but I, you know, even Letterman, when he would have, you know, a politician, you know, Letterman never, you know, a lot of people accused him of only being, like, of being a Democrat and only making fun of Republicans. And I know that not to be true. He was an independent or is an independent. Uh, at least that's what he said. And he made fun of Democrats and Republicans. But his monologues were maybe two minutes of politics and then, you know, eight or whatever minutes of other stuff. And nowadays, a lot of these people are just doing Trump, 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 which yeah. is, just, it's, it's boring after a while, yeah, you know? It is. Yeah. It's one note, and it's one note all the time. And on all three of those guys on late night, every, not that we don't like them. Right. You know, don't, don't take that as a jealousy or a don't like quote. It's just that why are they stuck in this material? That's all I'm saying. And it's a shame because, you know, if you know, you know, we're, I'm, we're New Yorkers and we know Trump much longer than the rest of the country knows. True. We know what kind of human being he is. And that's why he left New York, because we know him. You know, he knows that he can't pull that shit over on people. <laughs> you know. We know him well enough. We know him in the 70s. We know him what he did when the, the you know, the Central Park Five. We know what a, a bad man he can be with the way he, you know, him and his father kept blacks out of, you know, their properties and stuff. So we know him as that kind of a guy. Um, but he's more of a joke himself. So it's kind of a waste to make fun of him because you're, you're making a joke about a joke. Right. You know, so, and there's people who love him, which, you know, to me doesn't so make that sense. would be what he calls doubling down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> How, why, why is it that when comedians come on shows like a talk show, like we're sort of doing now, they don't do any of their shtick. In other words, they, they want to be talked about about their lives rather than coming on and doing a few minutes, even if it's two jokes. Now, you've well, done I, jokes I that, that was in the dialogue. Well, we had that happen so many times uh, through the years, uh, both of us, uh, you know, separately and together. Well, Why here's, is the, here's the thing. First of all, when a comic comes on the show and does panel, as they call it, sitting next to the host, now, those are all, that's material that they want to do. Now, if you do stand up sitting down next to somebody, it's awkward and it seems weird. So you write it conversationally so that you're having a conversation, but you're getting your jokes in. Like, remember right. Dr. Katz, that great cartoon? I got to do it. It was Jonathan Katz. And he, yep. so what we would do is we'd film all of our material in the studio by ourselves. And John would come in later and then add his dialogue. So you weren't right. actually doing the material, so you had to make it conversational in the dark by yourself. That's a, another talent. Um, when you, it's like when you're a stand-up and you're standing in, uh, in front of the camera and you have your mic or non or your lapel and you're out there doing your stand-up, you that's a different art form than the art form of sitting next to the host. Like with Dangerfield, when he was on Johnny Carson, or, 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 or more to the point, Buddy Hackett. They, Buddy were, Hackett. they were storytellers. Right. But that was their shtick. That was their shtick. You know, when uh, Buddy Hackett would sit on the edge of the stage at the Sahara and do that, that's what he yeah. did. That's what yeah. he yeah. did. But Rodney did his jokes for Johnny, and all Johnny could do was like, oh, so yeah, you know my doctor. <laughs> yeah, how is your doctor? He would just set him up. And that's what the, you know, as on the Letterman show, any guest who came on, the pre-interview was always with the comic and can you, you know, what material do you have and what do you want to talk about? Now, you know, I love you, Eddie, and you know, I, I already, uh, everybody knows that I, I, I think you're great with your comedy, your person, everything. So let's put that aside. Okay. And I want to confess, this is, this is a confession or not. Uh -oh. uh, there was a time in Philly when we really grabbed the audience on an AM station that was dying and we brought it to life. I had a great, it was a great show, it really was, because of the people around me and the energy that we all have, but they especially were funny. And you know, it takes a team, I think. So here I am with this uh, great show, and I decide I'm going to be doing some stand-up. So I went to one of the clubs in Philly, and I got the applause of a uh, golf match. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was really not making it. And don't you know, now listen to this one, you probably don't even know this. I'm reading Playboy magazine, which is something you do when you live alone. And uh, I, I took it with me uh, to, to the station and I'm reading it. 
And Stephen Wright, there was an article about Stephen Wright. He was just really a coming of age. You know, he was very clever and, and quiet. And, and he said, you know, and I, in the writing, I can't do his voice, but, you know, I was watching this. I was going out for a night in Philadelphia, and I went to this place, and there was this guy who was a radio guy that got up, and he thought he was funny. And it was the worst comedy I ever saw in my life. And he went, and then I realized that was me. Wow. <laughs> and Steve's one of my best friends from college. I know Steve. I, I know he's Boston, and I'm thinking, oh my God, well, so Jay Leno. I mean, you know, he's right. got to be great friends, and, and you guys are on opposite right. each other on TV. Yeah. But, yeah, but I'm he, surprised he would say that. Um, you know, he. He didn't give my name. Never mentioned right. my name. But yeah. I knew who it was. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. I told a story recently about a guy who screwed up a benefit. and. We lost a lot of money because this person's ego. But I never mentioned the comic's name and wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, but I guess, yeah, I'm surprised they would do that. It's not easy. You can be a great comic and just have a bad night. Yeah. You can try new material that doesn't work or do, or just come off like an ass you know, sometimes. I remember one night I was doing eight shows. You know, you would run from club to club to club. And there were like seven or eight clubs that I could work. Stand Up New York, The Sketch a Rising Star, uh, Gotham, Boston comedy, the cellar, you know, you just run from club to club to club. And uh, so I'm doing well in most of the shows. So on like the sixth show, I'm riding high. I'm so energized from these great shows that I went on stage at Stand Up New York and the crowd hated me because oh. I had this arrogance. I came in like, well, you guys have seen me the last six shows. You know I'm great. And they hated me. And it was a big lesson because I came off like a jerk. And I eventually got them to laugh, and I stopped and I said, I just want you guys to know you taught me a big lesson tonight. Because I came in arrogant, you hated me, I had to work my ass off to get you to laugh, you laughed, you made my night. Of all the shows I did before, this was the most important one because I learned a lesson, and thank you. Good night, you know, that kind of a thing. Well, that Hoffman, shows your character. Did, did Carrie, yeah, did Carrie Hoffman own the club at the time? At that time, yeah. And Carrie, Carrie thinks, you know, he, he wants to be Sinatra. Yeah, and he and he has a big band. He's very good, you know. And, yeah, and I, I also like him. In, as speaking of the Friars, I opened for him um, at the Friars, and I yeah. got to meet Chuck Barris that night, who was one of the greatest people in the world. Oh and, boy, is he fun! And, uh, <laughs> and he liked my comedy, and that was such a thrill for me. And that's the guy with the one with the unknown comic with the bag over his head. Yeah, yeah. And, he's, and he I stole the job. He stole the job from Gary Owens, who was my. My, one of my best friends. Gary, he had Gary on, yeah, he had Gary on the first show, and then he took it over himself. And yeah. Gary was never got over it, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I got to tell you something else that happened uh, with Stand Up New York because I happened to like that club, and Lisa Lampanelli was on my show, and she used to. I had to stop her because you know WOR was a, a family station. You know, we had the broadcast standard. You know, we didn't do the FM even naughty talk, what they called naughty. Yeah. Uh, and you know, <laughs> I love that word. So uh, uh, I, I had her. Uh, uh, we had a, a celebration for Super Sales. It was his 80th birthday, yeah. and yeah. Carrie Hoffman gave us a room at the Stand Up New York, nice. and and Lisa was on the bill along with whomever else was there. But in the front row was the mayor at the time, Giuliani, his wife, and the 12 year old son at the time. He was 12. He was a yeah. Kid like the Yankees. And yeah, I like, remember. I went to the World Series with the Yankees. And and you know, I mean, he wore that baseball running. thing all the time. And yeah. He's an all-American type New York kid. And, uh, and, I, and and so I went backstage with Carrie, and I said, Carrie, you know, uh, Lisa, you got to talk to her. And he says, he said, we'll just tell her to work clean. And I thought, okay. So <laughs> I said, Lisa, you got to work clean because you got the mayor's son and the, and the wife here. And, you know, I mean, with super sales. Throw a pie, do anything, but work <laughs> clean. <laughs> so the first thing out of her mouth when she gets out there, she she blows the F word, and then she starts making a penis jokes. You know, I mean, you know her act. Yeah. And uh, and then she starts picking up guys in the audience, and I'm thinking, oh boy, I left there. I you know I, I left early. So long, folks. Been really nice. Happy birthday, <laughs> Super. Well, you, you have to know if you're going to book someone who's a, a sort of quote unquote X-rated comic that they're you have to let them do what they do. You know, like, well, even, I, I even like her. I've said shit a couple of times. I've said, that's now three times I said something. If I do radio and I'm doing AM radio or doing, you know, 
whatever kind of radio. I know how to keep it clean. But if you're doing this kind of stuff, you know you can be a little looser. You have to just know what you're in. If you're doing a corporate show, you're not making, you know, I made the mistake. I was on WABC radio and I was filling in for, I was working with Curtis Sliwa and I was filling in for his partner. And I did a joke that I had written. I said, you know. Let's, you, let's mention his name, Ron Covey. Right? Ron, yeah. I was, okay. Ron, Ron was on vacation. So they had me come in for the week. And uh, I did a joke that I had written. I said, you know, Times Square, it used to be, you know, hookers on the corner. And now they have the Disney store and they're bigger whores than we had before. <laughs> oh, no, it's great sweatshirt. You're getting food, you know? And I forgot that Disney and e a a ABC and oh, ESPN was all clean. <laughs> and then they said, we, we don't need you tomorrow. No. But it's a funny <laughs> joke. And I did it during the warm up and the audience loved it and Dave loved it. And Dave said it on the air and quoted me. And, you know, but you just have to know where you're at. And I didn't know. I was in St. Louis and I did a Budweiser sucks joke and it took me 20 minutes to get the crowd back. Oh boy! Wow. Well, now, now I want to. Uh, I know we're we're running out of time right. we don't, yeah. because you got to go to your next five gigs. Got to go to the yeah. next gig. Well, right. Your next, you your next three go, podcasts. Go for a little bit longer. I told the guy that I'd be a little bit later. Well, I want to I want to honor you a little bit here because I had the privilege, and it was a privilege, of uh, putting the the TV in cabs, and I had a Russian partner, and I had to fight to have that. I fought the mayor. Mayor Bloomberg wanted the Bloomberg Electronics wanted to have the back seat with the TV in there and a phone, cell phone. Uh, we, no, we didn't have cell phones. I mean, you know, that direct phone like they used to use in the airplanes. So I convinced the city council after many meetings to allow us to put on a trial basis. And then we got it formally approved uh, by, by the Taxi Limo Commission. And they allowed us to go ahead and put the cabs out on the street and put the taxi, taxi limo drivers, if, the, if they had to have one control, and it was that they needed to have the off button for sound because people want to get in the back and maybe talk. Also, right. they may, maybe not like what we're doing. But, you know, the fact – nobody said that. No. But, you know, if, if you remember, there was Joan Rivers on a, on a, on a fasten your seatbelt, and there was uh, a Jackie Mason. Mason, yeah. Yeah, fasten your seatbelt. Uh, and, and if you leave anything in the cab, call us. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I remember so, it well. I have a whole routine about it. You were our, <laughs> you were our first comic. Yeah, that I remember too. And yeah. so in front of Letterman, I had to catch you while you were going to work. Well, you were, I always catch you between something. Yeah. Because you're a busy yeah. guy. Like, no. you between something. You know, yes. when the very first woman who talked in the back of the taxi, she said, don't forget to, and don't forget your driver. You know, she had this Brooklyn accent. And I always remembered the Heartbreak Kid, the original one with Elaine May's daughter, and she had the egg salad sandwich in her mouth. And I alluded to that. That was the original <laughs> joke, the idea of that. I love Elaine May, by the way. So if she yeah. came, I just love her with all my heart. But anyway, um, so I started listening to the things in the cars, and they were having Paul O'Neill, and they had, uh, you know, uh, like you said, Jackie Mason, and, and, but what happened was they started getting, um, they stopped replacing the, the characters and the tape started slowing down. So it'd be like, hi, this is Paul O'Neill. You know, you'd hit so, but the funniest one was Mary Wilson. Cause she was like, hi, this is Mary Wilson asking you to stop in the name of safety. <laughs> and it sounded like, you know, like, stop for the name of Satan. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so I had a whole routine about the, that and the voices. It was so great. But it's an honor, I mean, to see yourself in a taxi. You know that I was on this, um, you know, uh, Virgin Airways. I did a whole thing. So people would I do all the links in between their little things. And people would come back from the airplane and say, I was just on a flight and I saw you on the plane. Those kind of things are really cool that you get to be seen in those things. Yeah. Well, I'm the well, kind of guy that. Well, go ahead, it's going to happen tonight uh, when, when uh, people watch this, uh, you know, video. Now, yeah, all three of them so are going to say something to you. Yeah. Well, after, I after I see a replay of this, I'm going to want to be the middle seat in an airplane. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I think Eddie Bro to to spend this time is one of my one of my favorite things. No matter what we talked about or how we did it, there's nothing scripted, nothing planned. I don't yep. know where it's going. I didn't care. I just wanted to have you for a half hour to myself. That's yeah, really nice. No, I, I, well, I so did Jay. <laughs> I never, I never, you know, one of the things maybe is uh, my downfall is I never push myself like, hey, will you put me on your show or whatever? But I've, well, I've, you know, the last time we were all together in New York, 
Um, there, it was a power packed lineup of incredible stars and I got to be one of them and it was a short one, but I enjoyed the hell out of it. And I haven't been with you guys since then, you know, so it's really a pleasure that I got to come and spend a little time with you. you know? Well, you're the kind of guy that can be next to us and help us feed each, you know, off of each yeah. other, which yeah, it's beautiful. That's a, that's a, that's a talent right there. All right. Well, you have to run. Yeah. Jay, Jay has been like a very uh, good watchdog. And a good friend, you know, and and I have through the years. Uh, he, there's always someone you trust. There's always somebody you know that. I mean, you got yeah. your guys, and of course you guys were a great team yeah. on CBS. But you always find that. You always have that. And I and I have that now. I'm trying to think of. Uh, um, there's a, there's someone I, I must say hello, and I can't think of his name. And I'm thinking all this half hour in the back of my head or more, you know, of, of somebody that I. I want to mention his name, and he took over the Boston Comedy Festival. He started the Comedy Festival, and right. he's out of Connecticut. And and he was a really good guy. He was a, he was one of those guys that put things together, and and he loved you. I mean, you know, he he thought you were the centerpiece of all the comics. And uh, there were there was Carrot Top, and, uh, and people who who were around you that you helped. Yeah, and and I've got I can't think of his name. I'm gonna kick myself after this thing is over, but uh, maybe I'll have to text it somewhere. Yeah, but, I was uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and I don't know if you know who Roger Bowen was, the actor. Roger Bowen was the boss in the show Arnie. If you're an old man like oh, I yeah. am, remember the show. He also was in the movie Mash. Mm -hmm. And I was telling a story about Roger Bowen was a Caroline's, and he gave me incredible advice. Um, one night, he, I saw. I loved Arnie. I, I loved that, and of course, I loved Mash. And I worked at a movie theater, and Mash was playing. I saw it a million times. Um, but he was walking toward me. I was like, "Oh my God, that's that guy!" And I didn't know his name at the time. And uh, I couldn't remember, you know. And he came up and he said, "Look, you never looked at our section once." He said, "You kept looking to the right." This was early in my career, and he helped me yeah. to know how to look to the audience and how to play the whole crowd. It was a huge. A uh, turning point in my performance level skills. And the other night I was being interviewed and someone, I was telling that story and I couldn't remember his name and it killed me. And you just want to go back and put a scotch tape over the thing that so everyone can see. It was Roger Bowen. That's who that guy was. <laughs> well, with my uh, forgetfulness, I apologize to whomever you are. And uh, <laughs> you know who you are. Yeah. And Jay, thank you for, uh, for putting this together. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a huge fan as well. And Eddie, uh, best, uh, best to you. And, uh, you know, hopefully after this pandemic, you can get out and make even more money. Would you tell if you could tell your folks to go to OG Talk on yeah. YouTube to see that video. And if you're at Instagram, I'm at Eddie Comic at Instagram. And you can write me there and we can go back and forth and, and be happy. Uh, Eddie underscore Brill at uh, Twitter. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook, but I don't have, there's no room for new people, but you can write to me there and it would be good. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions and, um, it'd be an honor to be able to answer any questions that anyone has. Oh, chicken man. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so Jay, did you tell, yes. did you tell Eddie about your great, uh, your wife's great passion for Frankie Valley? Oh, how you, you uh, well, I, no, have I been didn't. stalking him? Uh, <laughs> no, that already, my happened. Baby. that already happened once with somebody else that did, did that. Oh, yeah, sure. No, no, and she ended up killing, uh, no, she ended up getting killed by uh, <clears throat> somebody we know who used to be in the Little Rascals. And Beretta. This is the story around the story. Oh, yeah. What did yeah, I bring uh, up? <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. Was that so right? Eddie, 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 Eddie were you, were you, bored, were you yes. bored with this thing today, this little hangout here? Did you get bored with this? No, not at all. Okay. I could talk for another hour. I'm not, if I didn't have, I'm helping a guy with his book and uh, I'm helping him edit the book. So that's what I got to do. That's what I have next. But he knows that I going to be a little bit later. I told him because we usually start at 615 and then we, you know, go from there. And it's a, it's a hard work. It's hard work. You know, it's oh, yeah. somebody's writing and it's very close to them. And you, and he trusts me enough to go back and forth with him. It's a lot of fun. You're a, it helps me you're, become a better writer as well. You're a bright light for our thing today. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it very much, and I need. I want to know when this is airing so I could share it, so that I can let other people see this. Oh, we'll we're, not, we're not going to put this on the air. No, that's okay. This is a training tape for Emerson. 
It's how not to do comedy and how right. not to be a host. No, oh, I'll get Stephen Wright to say how funny we all were. Oh, God, I love, I love wow. him, though. Don't get mad. He's the greatest. He's so great, and he's such a good person and so hilarious and so important to me in my life. I'm sorry that he did it, but I'm sure he No, was. I'm not sorry at all. It's a great story. And uh, great. Stephen King used to listen to me when I was on KB in Buffalo, and I thought I was going to wind up being buried in the Pet Cemetery. So don't worry, Eddie. It's okay. fine. It's all good. Yeah, he's really <laughs> a good person. I love you. You're great. I love you, too. I love you all. And yeah. Jay. Cool. Goodbye, Jay. Yeah. See you later, guys. All Thanks. right. Smile for your umbrella, no. but don't get a mouthful of rain. <laughs> <laughs>